Thank you, band, and good morning, church. I am so glad to be here with you today. And before I begin, I hope you'll indulge me just a little with something that's probably going to get me into a little bit of trouble. And I say this because um, when I was growing up and we would go to Marion, Illinois to visit my grandmother at First United Methodist Church, I sat the entire time um, a little bit cranky because I knew when the time came to introduce visitors that my grandma was going to call us out, and I hated that. But nonetheless, I'm going to call out my mom and Daryl this morning because finally um, they have gotten internet, and so they are able to join us in worship. And since I have not seen her since March, Mama, I'm glad to worship with you today. (laughs) So anyway, with that, will you please pray with me? Startle us, O God. Startle us anew with your truth. May the power of your Holy Spirit open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to these words, your holy word, that we might draw closer to Christ, empowered to go forth as his faithful disciples in the world. Amen. 208. That's the number of days, exactly 208. 208 days we have been living under various stay home, stay safe, shelter in place orders here in Texas. For some of us, 208 is also the number of long, restless nights that we have experienced too. I would have never imagined that there would be a time or an occasion that would keep us physically separated from each other for what is soon to be seven months. That is 30 Sundays that we have now been apart from each other for in-person worship. And whichever way you look at it, it is too long to go without face-to-face human contact. Too long a time to be separated from family, friends, colleagues, classmates, and our faith community. Too long a time to be separated from social gatherings and singing, dinner parties, and dance floors and too long a time to be separated from hugs, handshakes, and high fives. Honestly, our lives are not the same without physical touch and daily interactions with one another. And the absence of these things for such a significant period of time is something that each of us is dealing with in our own unique way. Each day, sometimes each hour, brings so many ups and downs, so many fast-paced highs and lows that it can feel like having a seat on a never-ending roller coaster ride. And perhaps it felt new and exhilarating at first, but the novelty has waned. And now the dizzying effect is more exhausting than anything else. Which is why this sermon series entitled Isolated, Finding Joy Where You Are is both timely and relevant for us. And while we acknowledge the onslaught of challenges that we're individually and collectively facing, we also want to acknowledge the oodles of opportunities for growth and new life before us too. So in the previous two sermons of this series, Pastor Leon reminded us that despite the depth of loneliness that we might be experiencing, there is no such thing as isolation from God. Then last week, we discussed the power of praying for ourselves, of asking God to stretch our tents and give us the capacity to transform pain into purpose for the sake of the world and for the sake of God's kingdom. And now today, we're going to be focusing on joy, pure joy, what it is, how it's often found in the most unexpected places, and why its role is so transformational in times of trial. So to begin, let's define what joy is. Um, The Greek word for joy is kara, and it belongs to the same word family as the word for grace, charis. So one way to define joy is grace recognized. In scripture, it's often the awareness of God's grace or favor. That is joy. And joy is different from happiness, which comes from a Middle English word, hap, meaning chance or coincidence, as in happenstance. 
because basically joy involves something deeper and longer lasting than happiness, especially for people of faith, since it comes from an awareness of God's presence in our lives. And you know, I love Episcopal priest, professor, author, Barbara Brown Taylor, and I found um, her describing it in an article she wrote called Treasure Hunt. Um, it was published in winter 2002 issue of Review and Expositor, and here's what she wrote. I do not have a million dollars, nor any plausible way of coming up with a million dollars. I seek happiness with smaller treasures instead. Really nice clothes, for instance, a set of copper-bottomed, all-clad cookware, and most recently, a Parker Dufold fountain pen with an 18-karat gold nib. <clears throat> and contrary to much of my religious education, these things really do make me happy. I enjoy wearing them, handling them, seeing and using them. But the truth is that they are all dismal failures at bringing me joy. Because when I wake up in the middle of the night and cannot go back to sleep for all of the fears that are taking turns sitting on my chest, it never occurs to me to get up and bring my 13-inch frying pan into bed with me. Like most everything else that brings me happiness, that is a daytime comfort, not a nighttime one. In the middle of the night, with the sound of my doomed heart banging in my ears, there is no getting around the fact that most of the things that I think bring me joy really cause me to feel incomplete. And I realize that my only safe investment turns out to be whether or not I abide in God. End of quote. So, joy is the recognition of grace, the awareness of God's grace and abiding presence in our midst. And now that we have that shared definition, I'd also like to give you a bit of background um, on the one who is going to be speaking to us from Scripture today. And I think it's important that we have a sense of who he is and what he's gone through, um, since his credentials and experiences give him the ability and authority to advise, instruct, and share words of wisdom with us that, should we decide to heed them, can help us handle our own current circumstances in healthier, more life-giving ways. And I tell you this because the words of wisdom we're going to hear are not easy ones to hear. In fact, they can be downright uncomfortable words to hear. But I encourage us to hang in and really try to understand what's being said, to inculcate why it matters, and to examine how putting these steps into practice can make a significant difference in our faith life. So we're going to be hearing from James. He's one who self-identifies as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the one who is also most likely to be the oldest half-brother of Jesus. So imagine the years spent living in such close proximity to Jesus, growing up in the same household, accompanying him in ministry, experiencing the devastation of his death and its effect on everyone closest to them, then witnessing firsthand, as we can read in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, the resurrection, ultimately resulting in his recognition of his brother Jesus as the risen Lord. Can you imagine what it takes to acknowledge your brother as Lord? So in the years following the resurrection, James became a teacher himself, and he became the prominent leader in the church in Jerusalem. And so whereas Peter and Paul and the other apostles set off to share the good news with Gentiles around the world, James remained in Jerusalem, concentrating on leading other Jews in following the way of Jesus. And this was not an easy thing to do. For Jews to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord was blasphemous. It was considered irreverent, it was insulting and contemptuous to God, and it was a very unpopular position to take. And as a result, the church in Jerusalem was ostracized for what was unorthodox, even heretical beliefs by the wider Jewish community. This means that James and his community were familiar with what it felt like to be outsiders, what it felt like to be marginalized, what it felt like to be isolated from their friends and family and neighbors, to be isolated from their religious community. They were isolated from the temple, which meant that the poor among them that were used to receiving their support there no longer received those same resources that had formerly supported them. 
So it is a time of crisis and hardship, a situation so serious that when the Apostle Paul traveled throughout the Mediterranean visiting all the Gentile churches, he collected offerings to take back to the church in Jerusalem to help those Jewish Christians there. These are some of the difficult circumstances that James led his church through, and he did that for much longer than 208 days. James did this for 30 years, which means James is a man who has firsthand knowledge and experience of confronting crises, of dealing with trials and tribulations, of putting into perspective the struggles that rise up during these trying times. And what he garnered from his experiences, he put into a set of wisdom sayings. Some call this um, the Proverbs of the New Testament. He wrote this general letter of encouragement for Christ followers around the world, the ones he describes in his address as the 12 scattered tribes. So with this in mind, let's take a look at the text and see what we might learn from James that can help us with the tests, trials, and isolation we're currently experiencing today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's listen now for God's word to you and to me from James 1, verses 2 through 5. This is the New International Version. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So James, in sharing his wisdom, begins by encouraging us to consider, to reflect upon, to ultimately get in the mindset that there is a beneficial byproduct to facing times of adversity. And as, as difficult as it is to believe and as hard as it is to hear, the beneficial byproduct of trials, tribulations, and tough times is a deep, pure, and complete joy, an abiding sense of God's presence and grace. And this is the main idea that we're driving home today, that joy is found in the most unexpected places. And as if James anticipates the how and why questions that we immediately want to ask, he goes ahead and lays out the answers. And he begins by affirming that we will face trials. In the Greek, uh, fall among them is how this word face can be translated. It's used again by Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan found in Luke 1030 when he says, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. We can infer that the trials that will come our way are often going to catch us by surprise in the process. James is emphasizing the fact that this is no if-then situation. If adversity should come our way, then dot, dot, dot. James is emphasizing that this is a when-then situation. When adversity comes our way, no matter what the situation we've fallen among that tries to steal our security or rob us of our dignity or take away our hopes and dreams, when these trials surface, because they will, then we have the ability to choose how we respond by considering, by getting into the frame of mind one way or another, some way, somehow, that these will be transformed into a source of joy if we follow James' lead. How so, we might ask? And then James goes on to tell us in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. When we face tests, we can be assured that they are producing within us perseverance, or what one translator called heroic endurance. And I really love that one right now as I think of all the first responders. And I've, I've heard Andy Stanley unpack this verse um, like this, and I'm, I'm summarizing him here, but he said, to test something is to determine whether it's authentic 
and real. Therefore, the testing of your faith is the process of determining its authenticity. Every trial we experience tests the authenticity of our faith and how real it is, how it stands up when times get tough. And the term faith, particularly in this context, he says, refers to our confidence in God. So he restates it then like this, trials expose the authenticity of our confidence in God. So what I hear is whenever we come face to face with adversity, it is only natural that we question why this hardship is happening to us. But James is encouraging us to also recognize that despite the pain and suffering we're confronted with by this hardship, we can also know that God is working in and through it in ways that we don't even understand. So let's take a moment to pause here and think about your most fervent prayer right now. Whatever it is, think about what is on your heart, what comes to the top of your mind, what makes the top of your list every day. Perhaps it is how isolated you feel right now from others, and perhaps it's something else. But whatever it is, chances are it is at the very heart of what God is doing in your life. This is why James is encouraging us to pay attention to these tensions when they incur and consider how they might be the place where God is moving the most in our lives, bringing about transformation in the process. And although most of us would not invite these times of testing and hardships into our lives, James wants us to know that transformation does come from them. By persevering and remaining confident that God is with us in our suffering, we learn something about ourselves we previously didn't know. And this discovery, this revelation, is the source of joy in its fullest, most pure and perfect form. So every time you make it through a trial and realize that God was with you each and every step of the way, an abiding presence in your midst, through your pains and problems, you become more sure, more confident that God is who God has revealed God's self to be, the one who is with us always, the one who will never leave or forsake us, no matter what. And in going through these circumstances, realizing that God is with us no matter what, realizing that there is no such thing as isolation from God, we continue to exercise and strengthen our confidence in God, our faith. And in doing so, we build a muscle memory for future trials. And this is important because when adversity arises and monopolizes our time and attention, when we are caught by surprise and fall among robbers, when we are wrapped up in the whirlwind of the crisis at hand, when the chaos of it all knocks us off balance, when the darkness of the storm presses in on us, it can be very disorienting, causing us to question, causing us to lose sight, maybe even causing us to forget what we know about God's steadfast love for us. And muscle memory reminds us anew of what we do know, that we can refocus our confidence back on God, giving us the ability to persevere once again, which in Greek means literally remain under the pressure. So ultimately, perseverance matures us into completeness and a place where we are not lacking anything. We become whole, complete, lacking for nothing, and this is the place where joy abounds. Does this describe anyone you know? For me, my friend Candace comes to mind. We met at VBS one summer in our elementary years, and we remained close friends from that point on. In 2014, Candace um, sought treatment for what she thought was an ulcer, but she learned instead that she had stage three stomach cancer. And gastric cancer has a survival rate of five years or less on average. So Candace celebrated her life and her remaining time by focusing on her faith and her friends, gathering everyone around table for good food, and in the midst of treatments and surgeries, she established a nonprofit she named stupidstrong.org. 
and it raises money for gastric cancer awareness and research and support for affected families. And in one of my last visits to her, we were able to steal a couple of quiet hours on her back patio to have one of our notable deep discussions. That's what we named our hearts to hearts in high school and we would sit on a dock at Shepherd Mountain Lake and talk about life stuff. But on her patio that day, she expressed how incredibly painful the years of cancer and surgeries and treatments had been. But she said that given the choice, she would not have changed a thing because it was through this time of trial that she was lavished in love in ways that she never imagined possible. She said she had no idea how many people cared for her and her family and that experiencing that embrace was overwhelmingly powerful. And she said she experienced that same embrace with God, that God gave her a new sense of purpose about her life and her legacy, and that if given the chance, she wouldn't change a thing because her perseverance proved how strong she was. She received the gift of knowing herself in a way that she would have never known otherwise. And likewise, she received the gift of knowing God in a way that she would not have known otherwise. These are the beneficial byproducts of adversity. Candace lacked for nothing and exuded joy, pure, complete, perfect joy. And it was apparent that day in her smile, her eyes, and the way she held herself and gave me her words and everything about her. And with tomorrow being her birthday, it brings me joy to share her story with you today because for me, she is a prime example of our main idea that joy is found in the most unexpected places. But I want to end with asking, what if this is not the place we find ourselves? If we don't feel joyful or complete, lacking nothing, or if we lack wisdom about how to even feel these things, well then James advises us to ask God for that wisdom and says that our generous God will give us the wisdom as asked. So I hear James encouraging us to pray for ourselves, like we heard last week, and perhaps not in ways we are used to, because for many of us, praying for joy or wisdom or wholeness may not be our tendency. What probably feels more familiar is praying for relief, for an end to the suffering, for an end to the pain, for an end to this time of isolation. But remember, in doing this, we may miss out on the bigger picture and plan that God has in store for our lives. So although these aren't easy words to hear, they are wise ones nonetheless, helping us reframe our current circumstances into opportunities to be witnesses to the world of God's abiding presence. God with us is with us. What pure, more perfect joy is there to consider than this. Alleluia, amen. Will you please pray with me? Holy and abiding one, in the midst of these trying times, we need you. We ask that you meet us where we are and assure us anew of your presence and steadfast love. Give us the strength to see our circumstances the way you see them. And give us the strength to see ourselves the way you see us. And may the Holy Spirit accompany us, granting us wisdom and guidance to persevere so that we can discover the joy that you have in store for us. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.